<laughs> that was Lisette in the background. Always nice to have help. Uh, so let me know if I'm not clear or if anything is not uh, visible or hearable or whatever. I'll try to give a presentation in 20 minutes and I hope I will be in time. It should be. So uh, as Lisette told you, I'm uh, her PhD student currently working at uh, as a manager, a water manager, but still working on my PhD uh, at the Netherlands Institute of Ecology. And I will be talking about uh, the potential of citizen science for lake studies. And um, it, it's mostly about getting people excited for your own study. Uh, well, actually me becoming excited because other people are excited and how you can learn and actually use all the potential that's in citizens for enhancing your own research. So um, why would you do citizen science? So for me, it was mostly about bridging the gap between science and society. Um, but it had yet the benefit of largely uh, upgrading the scale of uh, a potential study. So it was not only the context for the research that uh, was greatly enhanced, but also to raise environmental awareness, uh, scientific literacy, and to offer me new perspectives for continuing research or actually changing my direction into going into the more water management uh, side, which um, still allows me to participate in citizen science and actually lead some nice projects in there. So um, we're doing science and we're usually, or sometimes, not everybody of course, is in a little bit of an ivory tower. And uh, it's actually really beneficial to talk with the people, the citizens, and get them to understand where their tax dollars are going towards, but also uh, to get them actively involved in what is important for them and what should you focus on in your in your research. And uh, involving citizens is actually a great way to not only get your research out there, but to um, educate them, not if we're in environmental topics, but also uh, to address scientific literacy. And uh, involving them actively indicates, oh, well, lets them, um, well, remember much more of what um, a normal lecture would be. So if, uh, if you read an article in the newspaper, you might remember 10% of it, but if you actually get them in the water, picking plants, doing a Secidep reading, whatever, they will remember 90% of that activity instead of the 10% of just reading for it. So that's a huge bonus. Um, yeah, it's nothing new, citizen science. Some of the greatest uh, people in history were practically as citizen scientists as they haven't done an official study or, or actually uh, education for it. And um, the citizen science has exploded in the last couple of years and there are different levels of it. So from crowdsourcing and using people as a, as a sensor or as an uh, intelligence um, cloud to um, getting them to actively participate or even in extreme cases having the citizen scientists become the face of a certain uh, environmental issue. And the uh, oh, sorry, my iPhone just went on. Um, technological advancements have greatly enhanced this uh, interaction between science and, and citizens, and it allows for the large spatial and temporal coverage uh, that is achieved using citizen science. It can greatly enhance your database, of course, instead of one person going out there, you have a few hundred to a few thousand people doing the same work and the same uh, dates. Um, validating of data is much, much easier nowadays than it was uh, 20 to 50 years ago, of course. And um, you even have the citizens 
potential of correcting uh, each other. So uh, technology makes it way easier to correct um, your uh, data and validate it. And of course, the more you do, the more you understand. And uh, for the general audience, uh, the understanding of the, the science and the science methodology is a really big um, pro in understanding, for instance, uh, the climate change. Um, how would you say it? Uh, this, yeah, well, seeing what's fact and what's actually fake news. So um, I was, uh, during my PhD, uh, involved uh, primarily through a network, and that was actually the, the sister network of Glion in Europe. So uh, the citizen science studies we did were mostly upon the European continent, but um, I also took along a few of the lakes in the US. And I'm happy to tell you a bit about that. So, um, before we started, we were really wondering what do th citizens think about citizen science? Do they even want to be participating or do they just trust the, the, the scientists to know best? And uh, we distributed a, a citizen science survey with uh, 50 questions about all kinds of topics, including water quality, water usage, um, and also citizen science, of course. And um, we managed to get the more than 500 usable uh, service back to us and we analyze that data to see that um, water is a really important topic for a lot of people might not surprise you but still and um, if you make a, a wordle of all the um, the sentences or sometimes even uh, little you know, papers what people think about when they hear the word water and what it means to them uh, most uh, people indicate that water is life. So very important um, for life in general, for the environment, for drinking purposes, whatever. Um, there's a second group of people that see water more as a resource. And th this difference uh, was seen in when, while analyzing the answers to the other questions as well. So um, uh, in general, 85% uh, uh, of the participants saw a role for citizen science and monitoring and preserving water quality, which is of course great. But the people that indicated that they saw water as life were even more enthusiastic and uh, wanted to improve their lo uh, local water quality. And uh, we think it's also uh, uh, a way of uh, stimulating even more uh, activity from the citizens and, and joining them into uh, more lake uh, science and, and joining up citizen science projects to stimulate the water is life perspective. Um, and if we look at the whole group in 45%, they saw themselves potentially playing a role in collecting data and raising environmental awareness. So uh, almost half of them really wanted to spend like one day a month actively joining up in a citizen science project. Um, from that on, we, um, in that lake, we formed uh, the citizen science working group and um, all the, scientific partners throughout uh, Europe, they uh, found a citizen group to join up. So we have uh, divers that came from the Netherlands, but also teachers from Italy, fishermen from Ireland, uh, students from um, Turkey, uh, I think it's also teachers from Serbia, and we uh, brought everyone together um, in Eastern Europe to talk about what we could do as a citizen science group um, to study lakes. And um, so in, in total, we were at 11 countries and 28 lakes uh, joined in. And uh, together with the scientists and the citizens, we came up with two research projects, uh, one concerning microplastics that really 
underlined how difficult microplastic work is and unfortunately didn't really result into the type of um, research we hoped, but it learned a lot of valuable lessons. So um, I'll be coming back to that one a little bit later. But the other project was actually using something that we all have in our cupboards to conduct research. And that involved a tea bag. So uh, there were some smart people from, uh, I think, Utrecht University in the Netherlands and also the, the NEO where I'm working at now. Um, they come up with uh, a cool way to determine decomposition rates um, in soil, so on land. Um, and they set it up in such a way that it was really easy for citizens or even children, like you see in the picture, to join and, and do it in themselves. And what we thought is, uh, this is a really cool idea. It, they proved that it worked. Uh, why could you not do it also in water? So for uh, that reason, we thought, yeah, well, what is the difference between uh, water and land? And uh, of course, it is a tea bag. So if you plunk it into the water, it will lose flavor very fast. And um, therefore, we had initially uh, 20 students that came here and they buried, I think, more than 1500 tea bags in our local pond to see if we could recreate um, the methodology used on land. And we could. So that was really cool. So uh, to stimulate a, a kind of or, uh, a leaching factor, uh, they, were, they placed the tea bags uh, for three hours in the water, saw that they lost a really significant amount of weight in that time. And that's how. Uh, we created a kind of leaching factor so we could uh, use the methodology on in the water. And from there on, we knew that the methodology would work. We had a, a sort of correction factor and the leaching factor so we could compare it to the land. And we um, distributed the methodology through our 11 countries and 28 lakes. Um, so we had divers put them in the Netherlands, but also in Italy, tea bags went everywhere. And um, we had a lot of uh, kids also joining up. Um, there were so many cool pictures, videos taken <coughs> that this was really, really cool data. Um, so of course you don't want the data to sit somewhere on a shelf. So um, I wrote it up. And we tried to see if we could get um, um, like an environmental cue uh, in the collected data. So we could see that our decomposition rates differed from climate regions, but also from the trophic states the lakes were in. And this is data collected by citizens, so even ch children, uh, and we can still see it, the, the cues, and it was really cool to see. That's what I thought. Um, so this, the tea bag methodology has been used in, in mangroves, peatlands, grasslands, deserts, forests, and now we added the, uh, the lakes to this graph. So actually we now have a method to determine decomposition in all kinds of ecosystems, which is really cool. Um, so uh, citizen science uh, in the future is, I think, uh, most citizen science project is still um, mostly having people send in something that they observe and uh, not actively involved in setting up the methodology or even doing a little bit more technical stuff, which they are really capable of. So I hope the future will go from observing to more deploying devices. But you could also think about early warning systems and uh, of course, if you go further on, you uh, can differentiate between different types of citizen scientists. Um, what we did in the Net Lake Citizen Science Group is also uh, uh, does it again teach the teacher? No. Well, there was a term for it. I'm sorry, I forgot. But you always and uh, it is much easier to communicate with only a handful of people, which in turn. Uh, inform their uh, own citizen group 
than having to communicate with all of your citizen scientists because that will take a lot of work. Um, well, and addressing citizen uh, scientific literacy makes better equipped citizen science, of course, which will in turn get more data collected. Um, also, because there's so much data collected everywhere, um, there simply aren't enough trained experts available to analyze the overwhelming amount of data. So uh, having citizen scientists out there can actually help us getting, get further in that regard as well. So hopefully this will be the future. Everybody with their smartphone out there with a few citizen science apps which they can happily fill in when, while taking a walk in the park. Um, I had a few lessons that we learned from our uh, citizen science pro uh, yeah, uh, projects. And um, most importantly is uh, learn from previous experiences. There are people that have been doing this uh, a lot longer and a lot um, more elaborately than <laughs> I have and, uh, and everybody else has. And um, there's even a, a Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment special issue uh, devoted to citizen science. So it's really nice to look at and get ideas how to approach a citizen science project if you're interested in doing so. So um, also a very important lesson we learned that working with citizens requires different skills and the mindset. So um, uh, being creative with it to offer rewards for the people that deploy the most tea bags, for instance, make a game out of it, especially when you're working with children, but also with adults. Um, be very quick with communicating back or you will lose people very fast. And uh, allow for community building to actually, um, in time, um, be more hands off than um, because of the community, they will answer each other's questions, which will make life much more easier for the, the one who's supervising it all. Um, what we also saw, of course, is that it's really important to select your target group. Because um, as NetLake, we started with targeting children, but because of all different reasons that you cannot control, it was right, really um, difficult to have uh, and engage and um, keeping the project rolling because a one-time effort thing is usually uh, doable by teachers but if you have to go back a few times to the same uh, location or do different uh, or actually keep it going for a couple of years it's a really difficult group to address so uh, for the, the TBAC index, for instance, in lakes, we address people that, for their hobby, interact with the water on a weekly or monthly basis, such as the divers or the fishermen or uh, environmental groups or scouts, for instance, and they will be there at the water anyway, so it is not a big issue to actually do something uh, additionally to their normal activities. Much easier to um, keep engaged in your project. So this is what I said earlier, allow for self-organization, build communities on existing groups. The size is always an, uh, an issue. Don't get it, let it get out of hand because the more people will there, the more time you will be uh, communicating instead of uh, doing other things. And very importantly, you have to test your techniques because you might think that it's very clear and easy for citizens to do something, but they, sometimes um, the easiest thing can go completely wrong and the most difficult thing is as easy as uh, uh, putting a kettle on. So um, I think that was almost the end. I'll go a little bit further. Of course, it's very important to also think about uh, online privacy, uh, but also physical safety and uh, health issues. And um, data is, of course, a very big issue. Um, you have to have your uh, citizen scientists right off the um, ownership, etc. 
So citizen science is not free data, but it did allow me to have my first two papers on this topic, which I was really uh, happy about. And of course, there is a GLEON working group, citizen science, which you, um, they will come together, I think, tomorrow on the Lisette supervision. And I hope that there will be more projects coming up. Sorry, I went over one minute, <laughs> but that was it. If there are any other questions, I would be happy to answer them. Are there any questions for Laura? If not, I, I think uh, we should continue. I, I would have one thanks. question then, Lisette. Oh, I can't see that actually, yeah. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Lara, thank, thank you for the, for the nice presentation. Um, I had one question. One of the arguments you gave for doing citizen science is that you create stronger links between scientists and society, and that would help maybe to strengthen the trust people have in science rather than believing fake news in social media. Yep. My question is, it seems likely, I would guess, that the people that you reach that are willing to participate are in fact most, not the people that are most skeptical about science. So how, how do you overcome that bias in, in finding the, the citizens you would like most you know, like to work with to, to convince them about the importance of science? Yeah, it, you're right. You probably mostly have people already invested in the environment, but usually they have in, in their own uh, social group, uh, people that are maybe more skeptical, but because they participate, they are enthusiastic about the research, understand it more themselves and talk about it in their social circles. You hope via that way to um, find also the people that are more skeptical. Um, next to that, you get a lot of um, uh, attention to citizen science projects by uh, the press. So via the newspapers and the news, you also give more attention to scientific work and um, hopefully you can reach some of the, the more skeptical people as well via that route. Okay, thank you, Laura. You're welcome. If there's no more questions and I, Mind you, I cannot see if you have a question, so just speak up. Uh, 